Good morning, everyone, and thank you for your welcome. I have had such a good time the last few days, drenched in the arts, drenched in music and visual imagery and the sounds of uh, thoughtful people talking about how their experience of making things uh, is part of their own Christian journey. And so I don't want to leave the arts behind yet, which is why I'm going to spend some time with you in the presence of a painting uh, this morning. And I feel quite at home here, actually. I was, for 10 years, I was a chaplain in uh, a Cambridge College. And Cambridge College chapels are always set up like this, with people sitting down either side. I mean, they're medieval, but they, they have the same basic structure. <laughs> you can't play basketball in them. So you have the advantage. But that on the good ground are they which, in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. May I speak in God's name, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The ground, or earth, in today's gospel is, as the Lord himself tells us, to be understood as the human heart. And the human heart that is commended at the end of the gospel is the human heart that is open to God, that can receive God's word deep into itself and nurture it there, and that in doing so will bear fruit that outlasts any trials that come to afflict it. It's not only the gospel that draws a parallel between the state of the earth and the state of the human heart. As our Old Testament lesson, we have the story of the fall and God's threefold punishment of serpent, woman, and man. What Genesis allows us to witness in the form of this story is nothing less than the hardening of the earth. God originally said, let the earth produce growing things. Let there be on the earth plants that bear seed and trees bearing fruit. And God saw that it was good. This is effortless fruitfulness, which gives its fruit to human beings almost without them needing to lift a finger. But what had been a garden bursting with fruit, abundant in every way, is replaced by Adam's new reality. Fruitful soil becomes thistly dust from which he will have to struggle all his life to extract what he needs to live. The snake will eat this dust. The woman will cry out in pain in it, and Adam will wrestle with it in the sweat of his brow. And all creatures, human or animal, will ultimately return to it because of the curse. Dust thou art, and to dust shalt thou return. The hardening of the earth mirrors the hardening of the human heart that we see in these opening chapters of Genesis. Indeed, in Genesis's eyes, the hardening of the earth is actually caused by the human protagonists. For the supernatural order, the human order, and the natural order, or the non-human natural order, to be more precise, all are interlinked and affect each other. We see Adam and Eve descend progressively from jealousy at the prohibition of the fruit to greed for that fruit, to theft of it, to lying and concealment about it. And if we read only a little bit further than today's, today's reading, we see that the disastrous chain of sin is still not broken. For in the story of Cain and Abel, there follow envy, anger, and murder, as the heart becomes ever harder and dustier and more ungenerous. So that by the time of Noah, as we hear, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Well, let me introduce you to this beautiful painting by the English painter Norman Adams, once keeper of paintings at the Royal Academy in London. The painting is now, I believe, in a private collection somewhere in Israel, and it depicts Paul's encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. I wonder whether you would have guessed that if I hadn't shown you the title. Sometimes when I talk about this picture, I don't give people the title, and some fairly interesting suggestions are made about what it is before I reveal the truth. Well, I wonder what you would have said. It is an extraordinary image on a huge canvas, more than six feet high, and I want to share it with you as an example of a modern work of art, which I read as the fruit of an amazing immersion in scripture, which in turn enables us to experience an amazing immersion in scripture. 
It is a visual exercise in intertextuality, linking texts and incidents from very diverse parts of the Bible in a rich associative reading, which is almost patristic or medieval. It works like a piece of figural reading that, of the sort that an interpreter like Oregon or Tertullian or Bernard of Clairvaux would instantly recognize. It's the sort of reading that does not come as naturally for many modern readers. But artists, it seems to me, can still do it with a certain unselfconscious brilliance. Our eyes, I think, drawn first to the darkness of Paul's head, turned on its side. Long fingers shield its cavernous eyes, as shield it as its cavernous eyes stare blindly out at us. And here I think the painting invites us to make our first intertextual move. From Paul's experience, as testified to three times in the book of Acts, to Paul's words in the letter to the Romans. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, for who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we ourselves groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Norman Adams invites us to see Paul's head painted in blacks and browns as a huge groaning earth in travail. Part of what this painting is doing is showing us the cry of this earth, this world of ours, by making it look out at us through Paul's face. Adams has discerned, I believe, that when Paul talks of the earth as being in darkness and awaiting somehow a liberation into light, into a new awareness and a new fruitfulness, this description of the earth is also an autobiographical description. It is both cosmic and personal. The earth after the fall, the earth that groans in travail, confronts us in this painting with and in Paul. With those strangely root-like fingers, Paul, the earth, covers the surface of its head as if to repel all attempts to reach beyond that carapace, as if to harden the ground and remain untouched. T.S. Eliot's words from the Wasteland's first poem, The Burial of the Dead, comes to mind here. What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Well, the darkness may draw our attention first, but the light is hard at work in this picture too. Can we see the detail, the next detail? In the gloom, the gold gathers the light against it, to echo Ezra Pound. In the gloom, the gold gathers the light against it. After the earthy head has arrested us, our eyes turn to the gold in the upper half of the canvas, and we begin to see a radiant heavenly face emerging with blue flowers for eyes, weeping with compassion and sending penetrating rays of light which are just beginning to find a way through the tight outer fingers of the agonized head below. This second face is, of course, Christ's. We've seen already the fact that Jesus draws a parallel between the state of the earth and the state of the human heart in his parable of the sower, and also how the story of the fall could itself be said to draw this parallel. So now we have several texts in play, for the texts about Paul's encounter on the Damascus Road have opened onto Paul's description of the groaning earth in Romans 8, and this in turn has opened onto the account of the fall that caused that groaning and that need for redemption. And with the account of the fall, we've already found a link to Jesus' parable of the cursed earth in the Gospels. That's a lot of scripture. Indeed, that's, that head uh, turned on its side. Uh, I suddenly realized last night when I was at uh, the Amundsen's home and looking at the stained glass window in their chapel there, that that head turned on its side is also a classic image of Adam himself. Often that head, skull-like, is buried at the foot of the cross, and they have it reproduced in the window in their chapel. So Adam, too, looks out at us through those eyes. Again, we're taken to the fall. A lot of scripture, but even this is not the last word. On Christ's head in this painting, there is a crown, not of thorns, 
but of brightly colored leaf forms. Why? Well, an answer has been suggested by Sister Wendy Beckett, who I believe some, some Americans have come across. She's been on TV, hasn't she, in the States? Some people are rather fond of her over here. And she lives not far from me in East Anglia. Over the eons, some plants, she says, have evolved their leaves into weapons, into the aggression of thorns. Wearing them in love, Christ draws them back to their first innocence. In accepting cruelty and death, he redeems them into life, into gentleness. If the paintings already made intertextual links between the Acts of the Apostles, Romans chapter 8, the parable of the sower, and the account of the fall in Genesis, it also points us simultaneously forward and back from that fall. Back to the first creation narrated in Genesis 1 and 2, and forward towards the new creation, which reverses the effects of the hardening and cursing of the earth. The painting takes us back to the first creation narrated in Genesis. Can we see the next detail? The painting has something elemental about it. This is partly, of course, because of the apparent simplicity of its style. Though it's figurative, it borders on abstraction and has some of the bold and arresting virtues of abstraction. It seems elemental in part because of its fascination with strong geometric forms and bright primary colors. But it's also elemental because it evokes some very basic constituent parts of the material world, especially earth, light, and water. This is a Genesis world. The elemental quality of the painting, with its nearly abstract use of circles and lozenges, and straight lines is a correlate of the fundamental elements of creation that it depicts. Just as the leaf forms on Christ's head are thorns won back to their primal innocence, so the light and water of the painting represent a recovery of the fertility of Eden, whose primal moments of life are so vivid. Light called forth, life-giving waters released, the earth become a garden and man formed from the dust of the earth and life breathed into his nostrils to make him a living soul. But this recalling of the building blocks of the first and good creation happens precisely as we're pointed towards the new creation in Christ. We're reminded that this material world is the world Christ comes to redeem. We find him within its physical elements, working with them to change and renew and recreate us. In showing us that glowing face which gathers the picture from above, Norman Adams shows us the compassionate identification of Christ with his suffering people. Let's see the whole image again, the next image. Sorry, next one after that. There we go. It meditates on the redemption of that earth and its inhabitants who share its hardened condition. In a Christian perspective, it's into just this hardened world that Christ comes, who, as the figural readers of early Christian tradition interpreted the parable of the sower, who is both the sower and the seed, just as he is both priest and victim. The fathers called him the seed sown in believers' hearts, who comes forth from God that he may be the principle of righteousness in humanity. Jesus Christ, the sower, continues to cast his seed, the seed which is his own self, undeterred by the resistances of the hardened earth. And he keeps scattering until he finally finds good soil where he will be received and where he can be fruitful. In seeking good ground, the seed effects a new fruitfulness. In this respect, the seed is rather like the rays of light and the runnels of water in Norman Adams' painting, which keep up their attempt to penetrate the tightly closed fingers. While some of these rays are halted at the surface, others find their way to deeper layers. And eventually, as we know, if we know Paul's story, eventually they will reach the dark spaces within, where Paul, modeling the fallen earth itself, 
will be illuminated and renewed and will begin to bear the fruit of Christ in himself. Christ's work is to break up the surface of this earth and find its places of fertility once again. In today's reading from Genesis, we witness the beginning of exactly the process that Christ would one day reverse. We witness the point at which leaf forms became thorns and thistles, at which good soil became hard and dusty, and in which the human heart, once open and trusting and receiving all its good directly from the hand of God, became fearful, dishonest, concealed, and self-serving. We see a threefold punishment of the good creation now pulled into travail, a descent into degradation, into painful testing, and into unproductiveness. Degradation represented by the serpent who must crawl on his belly and be trampled on. Painful testing represented by the woman who must cry out in labor. Unproductiveness represented by the man who cannot prosper the work of his hands but meets resistance and barrenness at every point. This is the earth after the fall. The parable of the sower, of course, recognizes this earth. It knows what has happened to its former receptivity and fruitfulness. There are no illusions here about the fallen state. In a way that echoes Genesis, we are shown good seed rendered unproductive three times. First, the seed is trampled on, and we remember, perhaps, the degradation of the creation associated with the serpent, crushed by the heel of those who walk upright and abject on its belly. The seed comes to degraded creation. And second, the seed falls among rocks. It descends into the stoniness of the world, the place of testing and resistant, bruising hardness. Which, is the woman of the Genesis, which the woman of the Genesis story, the woman who was tempted, is promised she will experience as a consequence of her temptation. The seed comes to a creation that is tested painfully. And third, the seed falls among thorns and thistles. It comes into the place where the man experiences his penalty. The man who longed for the delight and pleasure of the fruit offered to him by the woman. For this desire for forbidden pleasure, he is rewarded with hard labor in which he cannot get clear of the cares of the world and back to the abundant, effortless sustenance he received in his first innocence. The seed comes to unproductive creation. Degraded, pained, unproductive, the parable of the sower knows all these aspects of the curse. And yet, into just this world comes Jesus Christ, who, as we know, is both the sower and the seed, both the giver of the sacraments and yet present in the sacraments themselves, both priest and victim. This Jesus comes to be with us in the curse. He is not afraid to be trampled where the creation is trampled. He accepts the pain and testing of our stony ground, and he receives in his flesh the marks of the thorns that are the marks of the fallen Adam. The miracle of Christ the sower is that he continues to cast his seed, the seed which is his own self, undeterred until he finally finds good soil. 2,000 years ago, at a place called Gethsemane, this man, Jesus Christ, crossed a brook called Kidron into a garden. And for that man in that garden, as for us in our place, all was not as it should be. The leaves had turned to thorns, the rich soil to dust, the open heart of man to a hard one. That garden was a place of sweat and blood and pleading and betrayal. Jesus' entry into Gethsemane is one of the darkest extremes of his incarnate life a life that is itself as a whole, a sort of crossing over into our human garden, the garden of the world. This garden is the fallen successor of Eden, 
It is not paradise, though we may find traces of paradise in it. It is more like a wilderness, a place of hardened and thistly earth. It is a place where only a few blossom at the expense of many others, and where some simply starve, and where almost all are in need. It is often not fragrant and often not beautiful. It is the world where human beings refuse to live peaceably alongside one another, but instead oppress and despoil and kill. It is the world where Christ is crucified, even though no wrong was to be found in him. On his cross on Good Friday and in his tomb, Jesus comes to the very middle of the garden of the world. He does it to bring life to the wilderness, to till and tend and water the dusty earth, and to reseed it. He dies in order to irrigate our parched, suffering garden with his very own life, poured out in streams of blood and water. Then he places himself in that earth. This is a God who will not stand by and watch the once beautiful garden he made be destroyed. When we fail to tend and water the garden of the world as we should, this God comes to do it himself at unbelievable cost. We may remember from the vision of the prophet Hosea how, with exquisite gentleness and love, God comes to his people as water in the form of dew. I will fall like the dew on Israel. He shall bloom like the lily and thrust out roots like the poplar. His shoots will spread far. He will have the beauty of the olive and the fragrance of Lebanon. We may remember how at the Last Supper it was with exquisite gentleness and love that Jesus poured water out over the feet of the jumbled jumble of people he had gathered to him. And in the events of the Passion, it is with exquisite gentleness and love that Jesus gives himself for the damaged array of people that we represent, opening his side for us and pouring out the water of life, watering us, so to speak, so as to bring us to life. Norman Adams depicts this watering by Christ in the form of his tears, which gush down toward the groaning head below. His death gives us an example. It invites us to repent of our selfishness and of our violence and to become gardeners in Christ's service, in the garden of the world. We too are to fall like dew on those who need it and open our hearts to let the water of life flow out to them. And we will do so by loving, as Christ did, those whom we encounter in this garden with all that we have. St. Paul was granted this new way of being as we hear him testify in today's, uh, as we hear him testify uh, in his own words. We hear the voice of a man who has become good soil. In his trials and afflictions, he has been broken up in order to receive God's seed more deeply. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. But he is also watered and sustained, and the fruit is magnificent. He lives now for the gospel, and through it for others. So although his wounds and sufferings tell of pain, they tell of more than pain. They tell of Paul's love in response to Christ's love, of freedom from the powers of this world, of new creation. They tell of that fact that precisely in weakness and fragility, one can be assimilated to Jesus 
and embody Jesus' true humanity and saving presence for others. Carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so Paul says, the life of Jesus also is manifested in his body as it can be in all of ours. There is a transfiguration hidden here and it can be all of ours as it was Jesus's, as it was Paul's, who experienced himself advancing from glory to glory. One day, almost by accident, I came across an icon of the transfiguration from the Eastern Orthodox tradition. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see it. And I suddenly thought, that looks a bit like Norman Adams' painting, The Vision on the Road to Damascus. This illuminated upper half and the browns of the lower half symbolizing those receiving his light, resisting his light yet, but being drawn towards it. And even the rays of light stabbing down towards them are reminiscent of Norman Adams' picture. You may have thought there was simply no more room for any more biblical texts in that one amazing painting. But there is the transfiguration. And I want to leave you with that image and with the message that in the same way as St. Paul, we too should be ready to have our hardened surfaces broken open so that we in turn can become fruitful with Christ's seed, contributing to that new garden promised to us at the end of time in paradise, where there will never again be a shortage of what we need, because a river will flow directly from the throne of God and of the Lamb, and the living waters of the Spirit will transform the thirsty land into a properly watered garden, and we will be transfigured. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.